Talmor, Sheshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, I'm Alison Larkin, writer, comedian, narrator, and host of The Jane Austen Podcast. Join me as we embark on a journey through Austen's timeless stories, starting with Pride and Prejudice. The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin is available wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm going back a third time, not not the same role, different roles. Mm-hmm. And the reader comes out, you know, she's calling people into the room. And she's like, oh, she comes out. Oh, hey, Nelson. So, um, yeah, so I guess uh, so-and-so, the casting director, has said, like, so, I guess some people have been coming in the room and, like, winking at her. And I'm like, oh, oh, weird, like, winking at her? She's like, yeah, yeah. And she says it kind of disturbs her. I'm like, oh, my God, that's weird. I'm like, I'm not one of those people, right? She's like, no, no, you are. And I'm like, what? what? I'm like, yeah, yeah, like you're winking at her. And then I'm like in my head, I'm going, oh, I think I have this like nervous tick at the time where I'm just going, going kind of like uh, at the end of a sentence or like walking out of the room. I'm like, okay, I'll see you later. Bye. You know, I'm just kind of like, yeah. all right, see you later. And then I'm like, oh my God, like she thinks it's some like, I don't know what she thinks it is, but it's just, I do it to guys. I do it to girls. I do it to babies. I do it to grandmas. Like it's not a, it's, that's nothing about coming on to anybody. Just like more of, it's some tick that I developed, right? Hello, world, and welcome back to another episode of Thanks for Coming In. I'm your host, Jillian Clare. If you're not subscribed to the show, make sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening and check out the show notes to see the exclusive videos from these interviews on our Patreon. What's up? Um, So I am recording this in uh, advance a little bit. We recorded this episode, well, we recorded the interview uh, like two weeks ago, and now I'm recording this a week before you're hearing it. Which makes it very funny because today's episode features a fantastic actor who was in episode eight of The Last of Us. So when we recorded the interview, I hadn't seen episode eight. I have now seen episode eight, but now that you're listening to it, you've seen episode nine and I haven't. Sounds complicated, I know. Anyway, we didn't give away any spoilers because I was like, please don't tell me what happens uh, because I'm such a big fan. (laughs) So there's that. Uh, So let's get to it. Today we have Nelson Lee. You may remember him as Beezlebub in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. He's been in the movie Prey, um, Story of a Girl with Kira Sedgwick. that She directed it. Amazing. Um, He has his own web series called The Gym that he wrote and produced. And funny enough, uh, throughout the episode, we actually find out that we are probably in the same place at the same time. Uh, Very strange. What a small world. And yes, most recently, he was in The Last of Us as Josiah aka the dude that gets it in the basement you know what i'm talking about um so here is my conversation with nelson and welcome to the show nelson thanks for having me jillian (laughs) happy to be here excited (laughs) me too i'm so excited to talk to you we have so many um awesome things to talk about that you have been in and are currently in Uh, But before we get to any of that, the first thing that I always like to ask all of my guests is, what made you want to be an actor? Ooh, wow. That's the big question. (laughs) Yeah. That takes three hours to answer, but let's see. We hit with the hard facts first. (laughs) Yeah. um, So I guess in one way I was exposed to it, um, but not sort of like, you know, my parents weren't actors. Well, my mom wanted to be an actor is the short question or the short answer but you know sort of uh came from this european background very sort of uh um dogmatic uh overlord father where that was like not a thing to uh Mm. to to do or pursue but when she came my mother is french she's from nice 
and she uh, she did study acting and dance. And I was in a short film when I was four years old. And she never went down that road. She became an interviewer and eventually worked for the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Company. Oh, but nice. um, yeah, so I was I was around media, not necessarily film and television, but uh, she was producing French news. She was working at the CBC and I would go there every day after school, grades three, four, five, six. And it was like this big, this big studio, these big cavernous halls with these giant coils of cable that looked like snakes and these, <laughs> those, those cameras from the 1980s that were like massive robots, massive, you know, that slid across the floor, studio cameras. And um, I think a, a seminal moment was I met Michael J. Fox there. He wow. used to, yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. He used to do these um, holiday Christmas specials, which... I don't even think they do them anymore, but you can imagine those holiday specials from the 1980s and 1990s, yeah. probably even 1970s. And he came and hosted one. And at that point, he was probably at the height of his fame, um, uh, Family Ties, Back to the Future. The best. And, and oh. I met him there and it just, it solidified that like, oh, wow, like that person on TV is here in the flesh and and like this is a real thing that you can do. Wow. So that set me on my path. Yeah. That's amazing. How old were you when you met him? Um, I think I was 10 or 11. Wow. Yeah, and we I have a photo. I should have dug it out. Um of the two of us in this old Canadian studio and we both have like 1980s bowl, bowl cuts. <laughs> it's very funny. Like he was, you know, the, a, a, a star and there he is, but I guess it was cool at the time. Right. And he's got his like yeah. Michael J. Fox kind of jaggedy bowl cut. I've got the same look. It was totally awesome. Um, yeah. My little sister's there. And I remember he, my mom was trying to take photos of us and her camera was malfunctioning and she was a little nervous. So oh. he took it and he fixed it and no. we got the photo. Yeah. Wow. He I think fixed it's on my, mother's camera. yeah, he fixed my mother's camera. I think it's on my Instagram way back in my feed somewhere. I think I posted it one time. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So you meet Michael J. Fox and then you're like, dang, this is it. I know I can do this now. <laughs> and then the next day, you know, I uh, was off to a career and making, yes. no, uh, no, <laughs> not at all. There's a lot of in between. Um, so on my, on my father's side, my parents were divorced at that point. He he's, and still is an entrepreneur and a businessman. He had his fingers in a lot of things and he dabbled very briefly in the film industry. Mm. Um, sort of as an executive producer type. And so, you know, when you um, all of a sudden uh, put yourself in some directories, like a producer, an executive producer, yeah. you just start receiving all these scripts and these posters from people who are sending things unsolicited. So mm -hmm. it was really neat to me. There were these uh, trauma film type posters that were arriving at our office, like the Toxic Avenger stuff from oh the gosh. AFM. And so there I am, this this young kid, maybe I'm 12 at that point. There's these, you know... Um, uh, yeah, just really crazy, cool posters arriving in the mail. And so, you know, he, he didn't go into it much further than like, I think he, you know, executive produced like a, an indie film. Yeah. And it, and he went with his other businesses after that. He's but, like, we got to figure out something that sustains money better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he stayed with the mining business, mining yeah. and real estate development. He, he did a lot of things. Smart. That's another story. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. But you, so you moved around a lot as a kid from what I read. You guys were in Texas, you moved back to Canada. Mm -hmm. And then when you were after high school, you went to college in New York. That's right. That's right. So, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm, yeah. I was born in Ontario. We went to Texas for a short time and then more or less raised in, in Vancouver, BC in the uh, mm -hmm. suburbs. Um, And then New York. Yeah. So, so, uh, but a lot of uh, American influence in, in that my dad had, um, mining contracts down there. So we were in Arizona and Nevada a lot. Wow. We'd go to California on vacation. So, you know, America really like held this, this, um, allure. It was this magical place where everything was possible. I mean, not that things aren't possible in Canada, but especially when we went to Los Angeles, that was the epicenter of entertainment, right? Yeah. I mean, it was just like, 
you know, my, my, everything was just bubbling for me. Like, like the crack in the sidewalk was so mysterious and exciting to me in Los Angeles. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, look at the, look at Runyon Canyon and look at these. I was like Dorothy, you know, you know, like <laughs> transported from Kansas. It was, yeah. So America and Los Angeles and California from a young age took on an allure for me. Mm. Yeah. So is that what made you go to New York for college or were you just like, that's where the scene is and that's where I need to be? Yeah, eventually. So I started studying acting in a, in a, you know, serious way, going to scene study class in about 1992, 93. I'm throwing my age out there now, man, he is an old (laughs) guy that Nelson Lee's. Um, And then, you know, even back then, Vancouver had already become a, a film epicenter TV, specifically a TV epicenter. Yeah. And then, you know, there were barely any places to study, scene study back then. So I was at this place called the Gastown Actor Studio. It was kind of like anybody who went on to like be somebody who either sustained a career in Canada or moved to the U.S., they studied there at the time if they were of that vintage. And (laughs) I remember a guy came back and he was studying in my class and he, he had done a summer class in New York at the American Academy. And I, I I didn't even put it together that that was a thing that you could do. It sounds mm. silly, but like, oh, wait, I can go to New York City and study at like a theater school? This is amazing. There was no internet at the time. So you had to go to the library, library and you had to get the pamphlets. Right. Like, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. You know, Literally, you right apply. when you said that, I thought like, yeah, of course you want to know because there's not Instagram ads popping up and like just yeah. in your face all the time saying, hey, come do this, come do that. Totally. It was like something that's, you know, you wouldn't think of doing that. Absolutely. And I already had a taste uh, for the the movies that I liked. And a lot yeah. of them were like New York centric stories and Martin Scorsese films. And and uh, so immediately when I when I got accepted in the American Academy, you could go to New York or Los Angeles. And I was like, I've got to go to New York. That's like that's Mecca for me. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, Dustin Hoffman and, and all the all the guys that I was watching at the time, um, Robert De Niro and all those guys, Harvey Keitel, right? They were from there. So I'm mm-hmm. like, that's where I got to go. That's mm-hmm. calling me. And it, and, and, and it truly lived up to what I thought it was. I'm, you know, I'm from this suburb called White Rock, which is this small little town, which is, you know, it's very white. And so I go to New York City and it just everything that I saw in the movies was actualized like the smell that that metallic <laughs> smell of the yeah. subway and there, there's like I'm, what you can buy a bagel with cream cheese on the street and you can buy bananas on the street from a <laughs> vendor this is amazing like everything was just like this is the best place on earth mm. yeah I get it I mean I've gone to New York a lot almost once a year since I was a child and every time I go I'm just like why am I ever leaving this place is great and then I get home to my nice big backyard and I say this is why I understand yeah yeah yeah. absolutely (laughs) I get Uh, that so you go to college and then what happens after that do you say do you stay there for a while and try to work things out do you go back to Vancouver um I stay there for a little bit um but I'm running out of money at that point so I go back to uh to Vancouver. And I immediately got into like a touring production. I'm sure they have something similar where you are, you know, those, those shows that travel to high schools and they're sort of like shows for kids, but they're kind of education based. There's like, Oh, you know, it's either about, um, Oh, drugs, you know, or in this case, it was a pretty serious, absolutely serious subject. It was about, um, it was about child prostitution teen prostitution oh my goodness the the word um human trafficking didn't really exist at the time i mean maybe it existed but it wasn't used as readily as it is today Hmm. and uh so of course i got cast as a pimp that was the beginning of uh (laughs) that was the early days of my typecasting that was (laughs) i should have known when that happened i'm like okay we're on the track for the rest of my career yeah that's Um, it that's all you're doing and so we had a number of companies like that in Canada where you go and you're talking about, I guess you'd call them social issues, right? Educating mm-hmm. kids through skits and role playing. And um, so I got, we wrote this show. We had to write a monologue to get cast in it. I got cast and we wrote the show from scratch and then we toured all over British Columbia. Wow. And uh, it was pretty powerful. We were the, we were the, um, we were the first cast and it's still running like 30 years later. 
Wow. Yeah, they've That's tweaked amazing. it, of course, over the years. But, right. you know, it's it it was pretty cool to be involved with that. You know, um, it was the first of its kind and mm -hmm. a very powerful project. And the woman who um, who started it, who initiated her daughter, ended up on the street. And that's that's why she started this with the uh, the provincial government. Mm. Yeah. It, it, it's always something with something that's so, you know, impactful like that. It usually comes from a place of knowing. Mm -hmm. So that makes so much sense that her daughter struggled that way. Yeah. So I um. Yeah, that was a really cool thing to be a part of and to have written and then to be acting essentially every day. We're going to high schools and elementary schools um, every single day talking about this, traveling around. And then, um, I mean, we're talking about a big time period after theater school and leading up to the 2000s. But I kind of lost my way a little bit for uh, a few years. I did that. That ended uh, and my agent dropped me. And I think this is like 1996. Mm. And I, you know, I was young. I, I guess at that point, I'm, I'm 22 years old. But even though I'd gone to theater school, I'm just, I'm still figuring out what is my craft? Who am I as an actor? What, it, what does this even mean? Um, yeah. You know, I think that it takes a while for everybody. And so I went and worked with my father's company and I just, I renounced acting for close to three years. Wow. Never to act again. And I, uh, you know, regretfully got rid of these theater books and some of these, uh, no. cause I'm like, I'm like, if I, you know, cause people would say, well, well, you know, get a side job or this and that. Like I knew even at that time, I didn't know a lot, but I, what I did know is the amount of dedication that's required. And I'm like, no, if I'm out, I am out. I'm fully out, you know, wow. if I'm in, I'm fully in. So I'm like, nope, I'm done acting. I got rid of my theater books, all these Sam Shepard playbooks. Oh man. <laughs> And, uh, but then, you know, it's like, uh, the mafia, I guess, after they, they never let you go. Right. Mm -hmm, and after two mm -hmm. and a half, three years, uh, I started dating somebody and she's like, oh yeah, no, I'm an actor and I'm studying with this woman, Ivana Chubbuck. I'm like, Ivana Chubbuck. I love she Ivana like, Chubbuck. Oh wow. She's like, she's got to school in Vancouver and I was going to study with her before I left acting and, and it just pulled me back. And that was the little, um breadcrumb moment so I started following following the trail and then I said to myself when I got back in around 99 2000 if I get back into this I'm gonna be good to myself I'm gonna be kind to myself as an actor because I was so hard on myself as a young actor I, you know just all the criticisms that we all have but but our, our work and you know back then were so vain I mean it was literally like Oh my, the way I look yeah. on camera and I'm horrible, my teeth and my nose and my whatever, right? I mean, it's, it's silly, but it's real. Yeah. Um, and so I said, if I get back into this thing, I'm going to be good to myself. I'm going to trust the process. I'm going to lean into the process. I'm going to lean into studying. And I never looked back. That was like, you know, mid 99 and wow. here I am now. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I I've talked to a lot of people on the show and they're either uh, before that, like 23, 24, 25 point where you're like, what am I doing with my life? The, you know, the quarter life crisis moment or they're past it. And, um, you know, I I totally relate to it because there's there's that moment when you're mid 20s where you're just like, what am I doing? I haven't made it. All of these people look at all these people. They're doing this. They're making it. And they've, they're already there. They're already where I want yeah. to be. I'm too old now. Totally. And I, it's, it's such an industry specific thing too, because they're constantly trying to get the younger person, the hotter person, whatever it is. And so it gets into your head, especially in your twenties where you're just like, why well, I haven't made it yet. So I don't think I will. Yeah. But I always tell people like, if you can just make it past like 30 and stick with it, then psh, the doors open wide open. Yeah. And, and I just had to, I totally agree with all that. Um, that is the toughest part of this business is the, the stick with itness factor. Yeah. Like sure. The craft is its own thing and that mm -hmm. grows and evolves. Uh, and, 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 and it should, you know, how you, how, how you integrate with the work at 20 will be different than 45 because you've experienced probably some loss and yeah. some disappointment. And, and so that, that infuses itself into the work. Um, and you've worked with so many more people. And when you work with yeah. other actors, then how you, how you act yeah. changes too. 
And it just, it evolved over time. I needed to, I also needed to just, yeah, I needed to grow up and, and, you know, the older I've gotten, actually the better it's been, like literally the older looking I get, the the better it's been for, you know, this, this old character-y face here. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And I, and I had a DP tell me, I think I'm, maybe I'm, I'm like, 33 or 34 at the time and we're having lunch and he looks at faces every day that's what he does for a living and he's like you'll you'll work in your 40s and I was so upset I was you know I'm 33 and I'm like I'm working now like like I I worked like a year ago you know and I was you know you don't want to hear that when you're 33 like you're gonna work in your 40s but the bastard was right um I just aged. I got more interesting looking. I got more mature. I just settled into myself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of actors too that like, you know, I always look at people like Allison Janney and Sarah Paulson who were working for a long time, Mm -hmm. but didn't start having the nitty gritty roles, the things that really made them thrive as actors until, you know, their 40s, 50s, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I look forward to that. Yeah. And, and we're, you know, we're in a great place now. I mean, you can speak to this, um, but I think for women now, like that wasn't the case 30 years ago. We're like, oh yeah, yeah, when you hit 50 as a woman and you hit 55, you're going to be playing awesome roles. Like in 1985, it was like, no, you were done at 35, but now you could probably say your grandma. It's like, who is it? Betty White and all the Golden Girls people. They were like in their fifties and sixties looking like they were 90. And everyone yeah. was like, what is happening? How yeah. is this possible? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was going to say that the people that, you know, we talk to our peers about like their experiences and you glean what you can. Obviously, you can never fully compare because we all have our own journeys. But a lot of the people and a, and of course, Canadians speak to Canadians because it's so unique kind of what we do here. We're sort of a service industry. Some of us go to Los Angeles. Some of us go back and forth. But so you talk to a lot of your Canadian peers and a lot of the people that I speak to are actually who are older than me are women and Mm. they're, they're freaking killing it, man. Like my friends who are, um, mostly have stayed here and they're like 55, 60, 65. They're killing it, man. Yeah. They're they're doing fast that fantastic. Yeah. So it's, uh, stick it out. It's the moral of the story. (laughs) Stick it out. Stick it out. 100%. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we'll be right back. As a podcast network, our focus is bringing you shows you love to listen to. But we also sell merch related to those shows. And partnering with Shopify has made that both possible and simple for us to do. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor adventures, Shopify helps you sell everywhere because they've got you covered from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. What's so fantastic about Shopify is how, no matter how big you want to grow, they provide everything you need to get control of your business so you can take it to the next level. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash realm. You can shop from anywhere doing pretty much anything. You might shop while working eating, or even listening to this podcast. And however you shop, we all know and love the thrill of the hunt. But do you also know how to get the thrill of the best deals? Because Rakuten shoppers do. With Rakuten, they get the deals they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Sephora, Nike, and even Expedia if you're looking to get some travel in. And getting cash back doesn't mean you have to miss out on sales because those can just be stacked right on top. It's easy to use and based on a simple idea. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back through PayPal or check. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T. 
T-E-N. And back to the show. Before we talk about The Last of Us, which I definitely need to get to, um, I first want to talk to you a little bit about Chilling Adventures of Sabrina and mm. what it was like transforming into Beezlebub all the time. I can't even imagine how long that took. Um, it, it's not... I think it was two and a, two and a half hours the first time. And Oof. then because I always work with the same prosthetic team, they really got it down. They, at one point, it was... I think it was down to like an hour and a quarter. Wow. And um, it was it was really cool. You know, I mean, putting on that skin just literally helped you transform as an actor. And then I did a lot with my body. I did a lot with my voice. And that gave me the the confidence also to just to fully transform. Mm. Um, so it, it was a real gift. It really was. Yeah. I mean, there's no like precedent for playing a demon. You can do whatever you want. So it yeah. must have been really cool to like, like you said, mess with your body and your movements and try to figure out like what this mystical creature would be doing. Absolutely. And, and I took a big risk with the voice too, because in the audition, um, I was not doing any, anything to my voice. I was more or less speaking like this. And then I thought, oh, I want to there's got to be something there. So I leaned into this gravel and I, you know, started working with it, uh, working with my, my recorder on my phone and then working in the mirror. And I thought, I don't know, this is like, you know, it wasn't big, mm -hmm. you know, because it, 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 it justified it, but it certainly was not a thing that they hinted at or asked for. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to walk on set. I'm going to do this voice. And I'm, I'm, I'm cool if they say, whoa, 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 just drop that and just talk like you. But I'm like, I need to take the big swing. And you know what that's like as an actor. You're walking onto a show. It's not your show. You're not mm -hmm. at that point recurring. You're at that point like a day player doing one episode. Wow. And and you know what it's like. You make some choice and you walk up to the star and, and like you got to bring your shit, man, and not worry and just take a big swing and be like, okay. I'm going to I'm going to hold space here and go with this decision and it and it worked out. It worked out. <laughs> I love that. I love what you just said. I'm going to hold space. Mm hmm. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, what we do when you're when you're starting out and, and maybe for many years you're working with, you know, these people who we, we, we call stars or movie stars. Right. But you've got to you have to hold as much space as they do, you know, mm -hmm. like whether it's working with. Pedro Pascal or the other people that worked with, like, because, you know, and especially if you're in a dominant position in the scene, like you can't shrink in front of these people, even though they might've been acting 40 more years than you, or they're, they're, they're so-called movie stars, right? You mm -hmm. got to bring your game and kick their ass if that's what it calls for. <laughs> kick yeah. their ass. Okay. Let's go to last of us then. Cause I want to know the episode has aired at this point. We were recording this prior uh, to it airing, so I don't know what's happened yet, but everybody who's listening probably knows what's happened. <laughs> yeah. So first off, you're playing somebody named Josiah, which a lot of people online for a while speculated was David. Right. I can say I am not David. Yeah. Right. Um, so this is a new character. What can you tell us about it without spoiling, spoiling it for you know people who haven't seen it yet? I can say that um, I am part of that that uh, that group, that collective that that David leads, and we know who mm -hmm. David is from the game. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we all, well, like everybody in The Last of Us, find ourselves in this really dire situation. But our group specifically is is uh, you know on their sort of last their last leg of of uh, resources, and so we're doing whatever it takes to uh, to survive and barely surviving. Mm. What was it? Because I played the video game and I'm actually replaying it right now just because the show has inspired me to replay it. Um, what was it like to be in that world? Was there a sense of pressure of making sure it was as good as the game or how was you, that environment? You know, I think what was actually a benefit to me was uh, I had not played the game. I'm, I'm not a gamer. So, ah! I mean, I think I had heard... Yeah, obviously when I booked it, they're like, oh, this is this is based on this huge video game that's like the biggest in the world. And um, for me, that that helped. Mm. Um, and, you know, the crazy thing is I didn't even know who Craig Mason was at <laughs> the time. I know, right? So You're killing me. <laughs> I know, I know. So stupid. <laughs> but 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 not. It was like I knew about um, um, 
Chernobyl. Chernobyl, but I hadn't watched it yet. And a mm. friend of mine who's a writer, she's like, do you listen to this podcast, the one that he does? And I'm like, no, no. She's like, oh my God, you got to you gotta listen to this because I'm a writer as well. And um, but, and, and the reason I say, I say it was uh, beneficial was because I think if I walked on knowing who he was, I probably would have just been more like, you know, uh, trying to get something from him. I just showed up and I did my job and I knew he was the showrunner, obviously, but I didn't endow him with this, like this, this great sort of like, Oh my God, it's Greg Mason. And oh, maybe if I talk to him a lot, I can, I can make an impression and maybe I can get on his next show and maybe he'll give me, you know, like I just went on and I did my job and you know, I didn't know who Troy Baker was obviously Pedro Pascal. Um, I was familiar with him. Mm -hmm. but the world was epic. The world was awesome. So just like game aside, me knowing nothing about the game, walking into this world, I mean, the, 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 the budget, the world, the set deck, I mean, we took over an entire neighborhood in Calgary. Like just, they put all these people up in hotels and they were just gone. And we were playing in the sandbox of a neighborhood. It was so cool. Like, you know, you do jobs where, you know, now you know my story. It's kind of like thirty-ish years long, yeah. and I'm, I'm. It's like it was day one. I'm like, oh my god, like this is so cool, man. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm just like, I'm in the game. I'm in the movie. This whole neighborhood is the movie. It was, it was fantastic. Nothing that's I'd ever so done. That's so cool. Like, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Did you have any interactions with um, the infected, the clickers, anything like that? Um, I did not have any interactions with them. And I try to put this uh, in a way that doesn't spoil any things. <laughs> did you um, see them in, in real life? I did not see them in real life. Um, okay. I, uh, had some, 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 uh, physical difficulties in other ways. Ooh. In my episode. Ooh. Um, it was, you know, it was, um, I, I kind of have like a few jobs that I rank as like the, the most physically difficult of my my career and that was two actually two jobs that I did back to back Shogun and Last of Us were just like I put my whole body into these roles and you know it's um man I I left that set um like battered and not because people weren't doing people were doing their job like it was safe to the nth degree but just because how much I was running and putting into it and just it was like I put my body through the ringer yeah Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How was it working with Pedro and Bella? I mean, their chemistry on screen is just insane and it's so yeah. fun to watch them and they really do feel like they are the characters. Yeah, but they're they're like, you know, you've heard in all the interviews like they're so cool. They're so lovely. You know, I'm 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 staking that flag as well. Like Pedro is um you know, my first day was with him and he's just such a cool guy. He's so lovely. He's playful. He's funny. We, we, um, we had some like colleagues in common. So we talked about that. There was a shorthand Aww. immediately, you know, and I met him at the end of, uh, a long day for him and I, I was just getting going. So, you know, his body had been through the ringer. It was, I don't know what hour it was for him, maybe hour 10. Mm. And he was, he was a trooper, man. And he was still, um, light on his feet and giving it and just like a pleasure to be around. Yeah. So nice. So cool. So fun. Awesome. Ah, I can't wait to see. Um, yeah. Well, on the show, we like to share audition stories. Those can be uh, upsetting or embarrassing or the ones that got away. Uh, <laughs> are there any that you'd like to share with the listeners? Oh man. So many, so <laughs> many, right? You're an actor. You've had crappy auditions and, and uh, stories that go along with them. Uh, well, okay. I'll start with a, a good one. I'll okay. start with a good one. Um, okay. The first TV job that I ever booked, um, there was a Canadian sitcom called Big Sound about a, an agency for music artists. Like, mm. um, yeah. And there was this director who was very famous in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even 2000s, David Steinberg. He directed like Mad About You and Friends and all, like, all the big sitcoms of that time. Mm. And so the audition was for him. And it was one of those rare auditions that we can count on one hand where you're going in the room with other people. And so they pair us up. There's three of us and we're playing brothers of an Irish rock band. Wow. So I guess they want to see our chemistry. And so they, okay, Nelson, you and you, you're together. And we're like, 
and I'm like, hey, let's go outside and re- rehearse and just play with this over and over and over. And so we go outside and we're and we're just messing around. And then I said, now let's do it kind of like, let's just like explore the edges of this. Let's play it antagonistically now and just like get really physical and maybe just push each other on a, a, every line, like physically push each other after we mm. say every line. So we're doing that and it feels good and we really get in our bodies and we get an energy going. And then we go up into the room, we get called in. And then, oh, this is Mr. Steinberg. And he's like, just do what you guys were doing outside. And I'm like, oh my God, he was, he was watching us outside. This is so, you know, at that point, I think we probably already had the job because we, we were doing it unencumbered outside and just loosely improvisationally adding lines. And he loved that. So we probably already had the job by the time we walked in and we just, we did it again. I think they gave us some notes. And, and that was my first TV job that I ever booked. I'd booked some commercials, but that was the first time on a, on a scripted television show. That's amazing. I love that he yeah. saw you and was like, wow, they took initiative. This is great. I like yeah. this. Because I probably would have been just like, I mean, who knows? Maybe I would have booked it anyway, but I would have been like, you know, that, that was very early on when I came back into acting. A nervous actor just trying to get the scene right or find my way. And, and he saw me where I didn't have that lens on right mm-hmm. yeah it was the it lens was really of cool. i have to be good i'm meeting this person i need to go in i need to it's and it's so yep. intimidating if you mm-hmm. are just getting back into it and you're not used to the the rigmarole mm-hmm. if you will um yeah yeah so that's it that's a that's a positive i love that uh, story it worked out well my first job and uh <laughs> So, okay, here's one that's that's so weird, and I guess I'll tell it. Um, this is more like, when was this? I don't know, maybe seven years ago. I, uh, I'm auditioning for this series up here. It's an American series, and I've been in for it a couple times. I'm going back a third time. Not, not the same role, different roles. Mm-hmm. And the reader comes out. You know, she's calling people into the room. And she's like, oh, she comes out. Oh, hey, Nelson. So, um... Yeah, so I guess uh, so and so, the casting director, has said like so. I guess some people have been coming in the room and like winking at her, and I'm like, oh, oh, weird, like winking at her. She's like, yeah, yeah, and she says it kind of disturbs her. I'm like, oh my god, that's weird. I'm like, I'm not one of those people, right? She's like, no, no, you are. And I'm like, what? what? I'm like, yeah, yeah, l- like you're winking at her. And then I'm like in my head, I'm going. Oh, I think I have this like nervous tick at the time where I'm just co- going kind of like uh, at the end of a sentence or like walking out of the room. I'm like, okay, I'll see you later. Bye. You know, I'm just kind of like, yeah. all right, see you later. And then I'm like, oh my God. Like she thinks it's some like, I don't know what she thinks it is, but it's just, I do it to guys. I do it to girls. I do it to babies. I do it to grandmas. Like it's not a, it's, that's nothing about coming on to anybody. Just like more of, it's some tick that I developed, right? And so she says, okay, so just don't, don't wink at her. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. And I go in and I'm doing the scene and we're done. She's like, great. And the whole time I'm doing my audition, like with my reader, like kind of almost like this. Yeah. Like, wide just, eyed and just like, and then, I can't wink. <laughs> yeah. I can't wink. And then she's get, whenever she gives me feedback, I'm looking at her like, okay, thank you. Thank you. And she says, great, Nelson. And I swear to God, I'm like, okay, thank you. See you later. And I'm like, oh. I like, I almost pooped my pants. I was, I couldn't believe that I winked. At, it was so ingrained in me at that point to wink as some sort of mechanism to overcome nerves or, or, or something. And then I look at my friend who's the, who's the reader. And then, and I just leave. And then, so that's there's amazing. there's there's more to this. Um, so I write this person on Instagram, my or, or Facebook at the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. That's crazy. She's like, ha ha ha. I guess these things are ingrained in us. And I go home, and I'm thinking about this experience. And you know, this cast director had it was one of those very interesting cast directors. Had been known to say some interesting, maybe intense uh, notes to people in the room. Mm. You know, we've all heard of cast directors like that. And uh, maybe over the line type things. And I'm thinking like, that was kind of a really over the line thing to do like moments before I go into an audition. And I'm like, yeah. you know, she's kind of like, she's done that thing before. I know she likes my work because she's sort of said it, but I'm, she's just, 
you know, I don't want to, she's just, she goes over the line sometimes. So I call my agent. I said, you know what? This is the thing that happened. And I, I, I thought it was like off base for her to do that. I'm like, you know what? I actually, I don't want to read for her anymore. And he's like, okay, I totally respect that. Totally. You don't have to read for her anymore. Like, yep. And then he calls wow. the next day and he's like, um, so awkward situation. You've got a, uh, a callback for this. And I'm like, oh man. He's like, but don't worry, producer. Producers and director are in the room. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Right. Like, of course I'm going to do it. But I'm like, I don't want to be in the room alone with her. Mm -hmm. And um, I go and I do it and I book it and I do the job and it all goes well. But I do say to him like, yeah, sure. I booked that job, but let's just stick to the plan of not <laughs> reading for her right now. Okay. Yeah. So it, that was a very, very weird experience. But um, I took my power back. Yeah, you did. You took your yeah. power back. I, you know, we all have developed nervous little ticks and whatnot throughout the years. <laughs> Yours was a wink. Yeah. Now in this day and age where, and, and it's, and it's a great thing, like a lot of, uh, uh, improprieties and inappropriate behavior has been exposed and is like, you just don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's a great thing. But this was not that, you yeah. know, um, <laughs> I wasn't really like, Hey, uh, I'll see you at the, uh, hey. the you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was, that's amazing. Um, I love yeah. that so much. Yeah. The wink, I mean, I, the wink, the wink, it's story. the wink. Most people don't even have to experience anything like that nowadays because they're not even in a room. Mm -hmm. It's just all over self-tape. Yeah, there's no winking issues anymore. No yeah. winking issues. Um, I love those. To... No, those yeah. are both fantastic stories. Oh, they were yeah. fantastic. Um, what do you have next? Do you have anything else coming out other than The Last of Us? Are you working on anything, writing anything? What's yeah, happening? I've got uh, Shogun coming out. Uh, that's an FX show. It's another just like massively epic production based on the James Clavell novels. Clavell? Or, yeah, Clavell. James wow. Clavell from the 1970s. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's about not. feudal Japan in the year 1600. I mean, it's Whoa. just, it, it's a giant book and it's on the scale of The Last of Us. Like, you know, 10 episodes, multi, multi, multi millions of dollars per episode because, you know, it's it's 1600 Japan. Right. And it and it starts on like a Spanish galleon. And that's where, you know, and I'm not giving any, anything away because there are barely any Caucasian people in this. And the ones that are, are uh, Spanish sailors yeah. who wash up on the shore of Japan in the year 1600. Wow. So that is coming out this year. And that is going to be pretty cool as well. I think the majority of it is in Japanese. That's amazing. Which, which is awesome. Yeah, no, it's it's like, it's a giant world as big as The Last of Us. It's it's super cool. Oh my God, I'm so excited yeah. to see it. And you have your own production company and you have a theater company. Where do you find the time for it all? Uh, yeah, well, we have a baby a now. Baby. That's, yeah. that's our main production. And <laughs> so, man, that just like... I was talking with my wife yesterday. When you have a baby, you and and your time is now split. You realize what is important to you. Like you know, maybe before were you like, oh, I like to go to the gym and stay fit, and I liked and and I'm a writer and I'm working on this project. And you you know, I, I was going to class, scene study class, improv class, and then you're like, you realize like, oh wow, these are the things that I really have that I really miss that I put aside, and so mm. writing is a thing that I've made a priority in my life again. So I have to get up at like, you know, uh, six or before six to get any writing done. And uh, it's sort of like you pick and choose, right? What mm -hmm. is the priority in, in that time uh, beyond your child? Right. And so I'm writing uh, a pilot right now based on a web series that I did like 12 years ago. Whoa, which this is reminds me. We, okay. We yeah, had we haven't. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we have I an overlap. Web series called Misbehave at the same time, and we both must have been at LA Web Fest in 2011, which yeah. is wild to me. Yeah, that's so cool. And and you know Brian Beacock from uh, McCracken Live. Wait. Okay. So Brian and I played Cindy Lou Who in The Grinch back in 2002 at Universal, what? and that's when I first what? met him. And then we did Acting Dead together, which my mom produced. Um, wow. How do you know Brian? So when, uh, 
we wrote the jam. We went to the 2000, well, I think it was actually 12 Web Fest, okay. LA Web Fest. I met him there. And then out of those, all the people that were in that, nine people, nine shows and producers were selected to go to the inaugural Marseille Web Fest. And right. we were one of those shows along with Brian. And so we all went to France like six months later. And it was, it was awesome. It was like, it was the first time that I'm like, oh, I can take, you know, it, it, again, it was one of those seminal moments where like, I can take a thing in my head, put it on the page, bring it through to the, the, the end goal, the, mm -hmm. the end zone and like, and create my own, my own work. My, and that really did change my life, that whole experience. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, web series back then were so cool too. So I, my mom and I created Misbehave and she wrote it. And then I think I was 16 or 17 when we first started it, but it was, it was such a strange time for web series because like nobody knew where to put them. Yeah. Nobody knew how to watch them. You couldn't really stream anything yet. So you're just like, what, what are these? And yeah. people would be like, what do you mean you want to do a show yourself and put it on the web? And we're like, yeah. Well, that's like what we're going to do. And everyone's like, I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Uh, you nailed it on the head. And it's before, Netflix didn't exist or in the format that it does now. Yeah. I think Hulu was just starting. There it was, was Sony Crackle. Crazy. Yeah. yeah, Crackle. <laughs> yeah. And so everybody in the web series world, like I, your mom's name is Susan. Is that right? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I remember that name from like 14 years ago. Oh my God. Bar Barrent or Bernhardt? Bernhardt, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, because everybody in that who was doing that work in that space, like, oh, there's this person in Los Angeles and this person in New York and this person in Paris. Like, everybody knew each other. And um, we were all ahead of our time. So true. So true. Go us. Yeah. High five. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I've I've had such a good time. How can people follow you on social media to keep up with your with your stuff? I am on Instagram, Nelson H. Lees, and that's it. I love it. Keep it yeah. simple, man. Yeah. Keep it yeah. simple. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been so much fun ha having you here and talking and reconnecting. Yeah, Jillian. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. Thanks again to Nelson for coming on the show and spending some time with me. The world is far too small. Um, my mom ended up looking at her Facebook messages and she did have a Facebook message from Nelson from like 2010. So weird. Um, yeah, the world is too small, y'all. Uh, so yeah, check out Nelson's um, Instagram and all that stuff. If you haven't watched Last of Us episode eight, I don't know what the heck you're waiting for. Um, and I'm really excited to see what else he does in the future because he's such a great actor and it was so fun talking to him tune in next week i have lynn downey on the show she is in the brand new series daisy jones and the six uh, we talk all about how cool it was to create a world that big and that fun and um that loved by so many so tune in next week and as always thanks for coming in contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwein, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Buntwein, wherever podcasts are available.